Oh, you know what? I'm gonna be second, aren't I? All right, it is uh, 501. Welcome to the Parks, Recreation, Human Services, and Public Safety Committee meeting. Uh, uh, we have with us uh, committee member uh, Lydia Sefadasan here on the stand, and Erica Norton is joining us on Zoom. We also have uh, Deputy Mayor uh, uh, Susan Honda and Council President Linda Kochmar, as well as Council Member Jack Dovey. And we have the, a lot of folks from Parks. Thank you for being here. So uh, let's uh, get started. Is there any public comment? Uh, yes, we have Karen Brigado, and she's speaking on behalf of the Arts Commission, so she has five minutes. Okay. Karen, remember it's Valentine's Day today. <laughs> <laughs> and point of order, do I get five minutes instead of three? No, I represent yeah, you, get five. Parts. you get five. Okay. Parts. Um, good evening, Parks Rec Human Resources Public Safety Committee meeting. Oops, sorry, I'm pushing buttons again. Uh, I am Karen Brigado. I'm a 30-year resident here in Federal Way, and I represent the Arts Commission today. I'm here to discuss, again, the 2022 COVID emergency unmet needs, one-time use grant received, from King County, it was received late in October. It says it's reserved the PAC to support arts and culture groups. The PAC has two programs that meet that, the Arts for Youth and the Five Resident Artists. It goes on to say that the funds will be used for expenses incurred during uh, the year 2022. And we all know that the Arts for Youth, wonderful program, but it was not functioning during 2022. Uh, they did have expenses during 2021, uh, an arts educator, which was paid for by the 21-22 CSO funding from King County, uh, but they have no expenses for 2022. The Arts for Youth is halted then, and uh, it's up to them to get the arts uh, educator, as well as the public schools to get their fine arts coordinator before that can start. But during COVID, uh, the resident artists were not halted. They did not stop their programming. They continued through virtual concerts, YouTube, Zoom, Facebook. You can Google them. This program, programming came at a great cost to them during a pandemic. Uh, gone was the private foundations and the grants. They had less membership. They had no audience. They need this emergency funding now. Uh, I will note that the 23-24 biennial budget approved by you as the PACs expected yearly expenditures of 2.483 million. Um, I've been told that this uh, negatively impacts the PAC operating budget. It's just 50,000, it's not even 2% if it's figured in at all. It's likely to force a reduction of already minimal staff. Well, you don't, <laughs> you don't rely on emergency one-time use, you know, cherry on top funding for something that's planned, budgeted, permanent, it's not sustainable. And I will note on that same biennial budget, page 35, it lists uh, funded and unfunded needs for the city. And again, the Arts Commission is not there. Nothing related to culture is there. We need to start investing in federal way. So I propose all or part of the grant be given to the resident artists. And I know the resident artists would appreciate the direct funding, but if you must, you could have it as credit uh, towards, the, um, towards the pack for all five of the groups. I have it broken out here if you want to know the amounts. They've been emailed to each of you. Um, and that's it. You have a decision to make. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Any other public comment? Nope. Okay. Uh, let's... Go ahead then to the uh, approval of the January 10, 2023 minutes. Do we have a motion? So before the motion, can I ask a question? Sure. Okay. Just wanted to see if the um, 
what was in our um, the minutes where Council President Coach Mar asked about the uh, funding for all the programs. Is that what item B is? That that is what item B is. That was yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. With that, I move to forward the. I move to approve the minutes from February 14, 2023, as written. Right. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, aye. 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 It is unanimous. Thank you. And that takes us to item B, City Venue Financial Briefing by Director John Hutton. Good evening, Chair Walsh, Council President, Deputy Mayor, Council Members. Appreciate you uh, giving us the opportunity and the opportunity for the entire parks team to be here on Valentine's night with you. So um, this, we've dominated this, uh, this uh, agenda this evening. So looking forward to it. I have a, a PowerPoint for you this evening, and I'm gonna go through the, the four areas. And then at the end, I'll be happy to answer any questions. I have all the responsible managers for each facility here um, for this. So in case there's a question that I can't answer um, for whatever reason, or I want a more in-depth answer to provide to you, than I can provide, uh, they will be here to uh, jump up and assist. So with that, I'd like to start with Dumas Bay Center. Is it working? We tested the clicker. Still not working. Okay, I'll just advance it here. Okay, so Dumas Bay Center. Oh, now you clicked it. Okay, now it's working. Okay. So Dumas Bay Center, as you know, we were just there for the council retreat, is a beautiful uh, facility. Um, we're incredibly proud of that and the people that work there. Um, they have done a fabulous job. And so we'll get into a little bit more. So next slide. Um, with that, these are some photographs of some of the uh, new amenities that we'll talk about a little bit later. But they go back, please. The, uh, the first is the Upper left is the new continental breakfast area that we built in-house uh, through the assist of uh, Autumn Gresset uh, helped us design that uh, in-house and then we built that with our own facilities people. That has gotten rave reviews and has turned uh, some really financial corners for us uh, down there. So, And then uh, the upper is uh, one of the meeting rooms uh, all decked out for an event. Uh, here are the financials, and just to let you know the methodology, what we did, and I'm happy to answer any other questions too, but we took our last good year pre-COVID. So uh, pre-COVID <laughs> versus 2020 and 21 are pretty much a wash in any hospitality or event space, the community center, the PAC, or Dumas Bay were all obviously horribly affected. People can't gather. That was very difficult. So. Uh, in 2019, as you can see, we made 925, almost $926,000 in, in uh, revenue. Um, our expenditures that year were 910, so we had a positive difference of $15,361, and that came with 226 bookings. And for those of you who aren't aware, and I know that some people aren't as familiar as others with Dumas Bay, some of you are very familiar with what they do, others not as much. We operate many, many things from overnight retreats, daytime business meetings, educational seminars, religious gatherings, meditation seminars, uh, weddings, uh, uh, all kinds of celebrations of all kinds. Uh, New Year's Eve parties, memorial services, multiple memorial services each year. So those are each comprised in those 226 bookings. Many are overnight. There are 67 overnight rooms there at uh, Dumas Bay. Um, so in 2022, um, you can see the revenue predictably would be lower coming out of COVID. People had a fear of gathering uh, in spaces. Um, you can see our expenditures went down some uh, that year, and the difference, we were in a negative $146,000. Uh, and that was 202 bookings. So we still worked it very, very hard, but a lot of things were really uh, uh, uh conflicted by all the different guidance. A lot of people aren't comfortable in masks. There was a lot of things going on and ever-changing guidance on that and then just people's comfort level. So now fast forwarding to this year, as you can see our projected revenue, and these are projections, but uh, um, we are fairly confident that things are going very, very well. And uh, I think we can demonstrate that. So you can see we do anticipate a pretty heavy, heavy um, 
increased this year up to 1.155 million in revenue. Our expenditures uh, will go down to 764,000, and I'll explain that to you why, for a uh, estimated positive difference of $391,000. Uh, pretty impressive. That's 205 bookings. Those are the bookings that David and Judy have on the books right now. And they're consistently taking phone calls every single day for more. So I want to have some talking points on Dumas Bay. And again, at the end of the total presentation, um, I will uh, be open for questions for myself and the whole team. So the projected savings that you see in 23 are due to multiple factors, including Number one, and a, and a big chunk, is we no longer have a full-time chef down there. We made a uh, business decision to uh, get out of the chef business and kind of out of the food business internally, uh, with the exception of the Continental Breakfast. Um, and we have big savings with that. You're not shopping every day for groceries uh, to feed groups of 50, 80, 100 people, sometimes three and, uh, two and three at the same time, seven days a week, that breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So obviously we have a bunch of savings from not shopping every day for food. And uh, it also allowed us to tighten up our inventory controls because all of our food is now trucked directly to us, easily accounted for on delivery, inventory, management, the entire thing just got cleaner and tighter because we only serve one meal a day and that is the continental breakfast. Which by the way, just as a, a kind of a bragging point, we had a group in the building shortly after we opened it and uh, we kind of, Autumn was there, kind of checking on the progress of the Continental Breakfast, how it was going, and we caught three or four gentlemen walking around, snooping around, opening cupboards, and finally we were trying to figure out what they were doing. They were very nice people. They were part of the group that was there. And one of them kind of um, explained that, uh, let the others, the secret out, that these gentlemen all worked for the Food Network and were raving. They were at a different conference, but their regular jobs were Food Network people, and they were bragging about how unbelievably good our uh, continental breakfast is, how well stocked it is, how we have things for everybody, food allergy that there is out there. No dairy, no egg, all of that stuff is available. So somebody, no matter what their food allergy or consistency is, they have something to eat. It's very unusual. My wife suffers from a food allergy. It's not always easy. In this situation, we have something for everybody. Um, so that's really cool. We're very happy with that. Um, so again, the food is now sole sourced, delivered, very easy to control inventory. Um, and the other uh, increase in revenue also came from uh, some slight increases incrementally that we've done normal, normal business practice for rates of room rentals and uh, meeting space. So as, as you also know, DBC, because most of you go to it every year, um, DBC is the host for one of the real bright spots in our city with Fusion, the Fusion fundraiser that's there every year. Um, this year, just as a reminder, we're very proud of the small role that we play as the facility and helping them uh, be as profitable as possible for their fundraiser. They raised $384,000 at that event this year. That's pretty amazing, and that's a great partnership that we're very proud of. We're also uh, very proud of our partnership with Center Stage Theater that operates out of uh, the Knudsen Family Theater. And uh, the Knudsen Family Theater, when it's not being occupied by Center Stage, is a rental opportunity for David and Dumas Bay to... Uh, increase revenues there. So Dumas Bay is so much more than the average person sees. We have groups that have been coming to us for over 20 years, every single year, over and over, and count on us, and, and we're very proud to have them, numerous of those groups. And this year, we've, we've gotten almost every single group back that we've had. Of our long time, we may be up to all of them, uh, of all of our returning groups. So uh, moving on to the next, uh, well, some highlights before we go. Um, again, high return of groups, Fusion's annual fundraiser. One of the new groups that we've gotten is the Native Organizers Alliance. Uh, Native Americans uh, have, they have a large organizational council, and I don't pretend to know a lot about it, but they operate and they represent many, many, many tribes across the United States, and they have just raved about their experience and keep coming back. So we're thrilled to have them. They love the way they're treated. They love the, the ambiance of the building and the views, obviously. Again, I talked about the build out of the Continental Breakfast area, that has been fantastic. And that included changing the food service model. We now have a catered option that you just recently approved a change, a small change to the catering contract as we continue to tweak that. And we've been recently, uh, what happens now is Dumas Bay staff actually interacts with the customer, places the order directly with the caterer, taking out the confusion between customer and caterer, 
and everybody seems to be much happier. The, the caterer is getting rave reviews for her food quality and service, and it took away a lot of confusion points uh, in the communication loop. So can we, we can, <coughs> can move yeah. to the next slide. Did yeah, you, can, uh, well, we have some questions for you. Maybe you want to the conclusion. questions about Dumas? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to talk about the, the caterer. Mm -hmm. She's kind of expensive, you know, from what we found for trying to get food there for the retreat. So has anyone mentioned, any of uh, your clients mentioned the increased cost for catering or for food down there? Well, I, I, I don't want to be evasive at all. I will tell you, we had, we had one bidder on the catering, one. We went out to bid twice. We had one, one bidder. Um, food costs, we all grocery shop. Right. Food costs are through the roof. Um, we knew that last year proteins were through, through COVID, proteins of all kinds, any meat, fish, anything, poultry, all of the proteins went through the roof. We feel it on our own grocery bill every time we go grocery shopping. It's no change for them. They don't get any better deals than we do. Um, so the cost of food is high. We believe that in the, in the past, obviously, when we had the in-house caterer, or the in-house chef, rather, fabulous. Nothing bad to say about that. Uh, person, we just needed a change model. Um, that reality wasn't always being reflected um, of what the food cost versus what you really got. And so Dumas Bay was kind of shouldering that delta between what we actually took in versus what we put on people's plates. And we were frankly overfeeding people. So to answer your question, uh, Deputy Mayor, <laughs> yes, I don't want to be to say nobody's ever said, "Woo, the cost of food is high." Um, Yes, they have, but I believe, and David, if you can give me at least a nod, he just sent me some updates for this presentation with people raving. There were no complaints about food cost in, the, in this recent round of compliments, uh, but it was raving compliments about the quality and the service of the food and the okay. taste of the food. So, uh, What about weddings? How many weddings are you doing down there? Dave, I don't know off the top of my head how many. We don't. We're not in the big wedding business. The wedding business is a is not a tremendously high focus for us, and there's reasons for that, and good economic sound reasons. A wedding you have, especially when we were in the chef model, you have one chance to get it right in a wedding. If you have a chef, if something goes wrong, you've got a very angry bride, and the only thing scarier than an angry bride is the bride's mother, and you've lost them forever. <laughs> Uh, short of hockey moms, those are the two scariest things in the world. So uh, with, with that, uh, we don't chase the wedding business super aggressively, although we did keep our promise to council and did go to the wedding show recently um, up in Seattle, and we plan to go to another event show. But overnight guests are really our niche. That's what we want. We want overnight stays. Weddings are great if they go well, and it'll probably be better with a caterer because that is a more of a reflection if the if the bride or the bride's family is unhappy with the with the meal they're going to blame the caterer but remember they hosted it at our facility so weddings can be a bit dicey and a little scary um, although we do them and we do a lot 10 or more right now on the books we have probably between 6 to 10 6 to 10 on the books right now so i know when my kids were getting married and their friends were getting married I know my daughter wanted to get married there, but the reception room was way too small. Yeah, it only seats like 97. And then I attended a wedding there that uh, the family had rented a tent, and they could have a lot more people. We talked about doing rent as a city renting a tent when I was first on council so that we could increase the amount of weddings down there because it's a beautiful view. It's a beautiful place for a wedding. And I would still think that that's something we might want to look at in the future because we can't seat them inside because it's too small for most weddings. But if we had a tent that as a city, we could, of course, charge people to use it and perhaps increase the amount of weddings that we have there. Certainly a possibility. Currently the only outdoor event that we do at Dumas Bay is Fusion. Um, and it's always been my understanding that outdoor events are highly discouraged there due to, and I'll, I'll tell you, this is an absolute truth. I took the phone call myself. I was at Fusion this year. We had a band. All of you were there. Many of you were there. Did you think that band was loud? I don't think they were overly loud at all. 
we got three complaints from neighbors about the sound, the way it travels back up, up and down the road. So outdoor, it, we're trying to be considerate of the neighbors to a degree. Fusion is the only outdoor event. I'm not saying it can't ever happen, but we try to be a little conscious of that. Um, my understanding is we do allow weddings on the grounds, but then you have to come in for your reception. So you're allowed to say, I do, I do, kiss the bride, and then go inside. But we do not, we don't own that tent, and owning that tent is a great idea on its face, but then it's a lot of labor to take care of it. It's a lot of labor to set it up, take it down, store it. Um, so it's probably be more efficient for us to have the wedding party rent it from a professional party, which is certainly possible. We rent tents all the time, red, white, and blues, concerts in the park. Uh, holiday tree lighting, all of that. We well, it's that. an idea I think that we should continue to look Absolutely. At. We can take thank a look you. at that. Absolutely. Right. Uh, Council President Coach Martin. Thank, thank you, uh, Chair. So, uh, John, you know, um, this isn't anything we could decide tonight, but I'd like to float the idea. Um, many years ago, I'd say 20 years ago, we looked at making the Dumas Bay into a much larger facility. Part of the problem was parking, um, more like Cedarbrook Lodge. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, it needs to stay in our hands because that was one of the um, agreements we made with the nuns, who, the visitation nuns that we bought this from. Um, but at some point, I think we should look at partnering with a company to redevelop that beautiful property into something that's more usable, more larger, uh, more developable, uh, continuing with Knudsen Bay Theater there. Um, and so I just just want to float the idea. At some sure. point, we need to look at that. Sure. Right. Uh, Jack. Yeah, I just, excuse me. I just had one question. Sure. It looked like in, uh, oh. Can you go what was it, 20, oh, your first one, you were basically $4,000 per yeah, thing that we did, 226 divided by 925, or the other way. And now you're up to $5,000 per event on average. <clears throat> is that because prices have gone up? Prices uh, weren't raised dramatically to the groups. They were oh, your slight increases. Your percentage of profits gone way up. That's again, I, I think I a mean, lot of that on, is on the gross, not on yeah. the net. The food food costs dropped um, completely, and a full time which, person with with but, benefits. Which I'm not complaining about, but my question is, where's the sweet spot? Have you figured out if it's 200? If you had done 227 in 2019, would your profits have gone up substantially more from 15,000? Or, I mean, how many, do you know what, how many events you want to do a year where the sweet spot is for performance? One second. Okay, Autumn brings up a good point, and I apologize for. Okay. No, nobody's whispering here. No, no. <laughs> so, uh, the 205 rentals that are shown in 23, that's just what's on the books right now. We have capacity to go much higher yeah. than we're at now. I don't know that we've identified a true sweet spot, but that is a great challenge. Dave, that's coming at you. Um, so, to, uh, to identify, I would say it's somewhere between 250 and 300, I'm just guessing. Um, you know, to maximize the amount of use completely. So. Okay. That's oh, good. I mean, you're doing a great job when you look at your projections and how much revenue per event. I was just curious. Uh, I mean, two, two fifty, three hundred seems an awful lot for that place. You guys would be way overworked and need a lot more staff, I would think. <laughs> but I don't yeah. know. And, and and as a point to that, and thank you for bringing that up, uh, Council Member. We have two full-time staff at Dumas Bay. Two, David and Judy. Judy Ferguson, the admin, and David. That's our only full-time staff at Dumas Bay. That's it. The rest is part-time, and they do a fabulous job. So you see those dollars coming in with two full-time staff, pretty amazing. They're, they're, they do a great job, and incredibly proud of, of that building and the people in it, as I am of the others that you'll hear soon. So, so kind of moving on to uh, our next. Actually, Council Member Asafa Dawson. Oh, I'm sorry, Lydia, I didn't question. see question. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, so is there a minimum number of overnight guests when people book or 12 we book so 12 overnight guests to get overnight you have to you have to have 12 now you could rent it with nine but you're gonna rent 12 rooms got it okay and then um, actually 
to your point, I think David and I had this co uh, conversation the other day about hosting something outdoors, so I think that would be a great thing to do for, um, especially for weddings in the spring and summertime. Uh, my other question is, with catering and food, is there a point where we would allow people to bring their own food as an ethnic type of foods? What would be the um, policy on that? We try hard to avoid doing that for obvious reasons. The minute you start, you open, it becomes a very slippery slope. Um, the minute you start doing that, we would, <coughs> I'm not saying we wouldn't, but we try hard to get our caterer to do that. If you start taking away their business, they be, remember, we had one bidder. You start chipping away at their business, and they're going, you don't really even appreciate me. You, you know, now, if they can't produce, and Kay, who's been great to work with, Kay Catering, uh, in certain cases, if it's, a, if it's a very unique food type, like maybe an Ethiopian food, I'm guessing you're, guess, you're yeah. talking about, that might be something she would go, I'll take a pass on that. But we always give her first right of refusal. And we don't want to do that in a way that feels punitive to her. Like, they don't want to use you. They want their own person. That feels a little punitive. We, oh. But if, if, it was, if it was couched the right way, then it's a possibility. And, and she has been very good to work with. So I, I would say that's certainly a possibility. But it's not an area we want to go with because we don't have caterers beating down our doors. That's the problem. If we had a whole bunch of caterers, then we could, we could but we, want, we need to take care of our partners a little bit and be good partners to them. Yeah, like you said, I mean, Ethiopian type of food, I don't think, I wouldn't even expect her to make. But I think that question also is for um, the community center and all the other rentals that sure. we have. So thank you, though. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Then I, I have a couple of questions, too. Uh, you're talking about marketing. You did the, the, uh, one of the bridal shows. Are you, you going to be at the Northwest event show? I believe there right. is a contingent. Leaf said yes, okay. there's a contingent Excellent. going. And we had all three buildings represented. Great. Excellent. Excellent. It is, I think it is the show to be to be at for this type of thing. And frankly, just on that, we did not feel that it was very lucrative for us to be at the wedding show. That, that we think the event show is going to be better. I agree uh, that, with that you. I agree wholeheartedly. I agree wholeheartedly. So, you know, especially if, if you're only, yeah, yeah, I, with a venue that small. Yeah, it's, we made a promise not, and we kept it. Yeah, as a, so. you know that we would be there. Yeah. but the Northwest event show should be much more. Right. Uh, and, and also with things like the the, the theater there, uh, with uh, do, do they have a flat rate rental or is it a percentage of, of their ticket intake or, or how how does that work? I wasn't prepared to answer that. They do have they pay us I believe a dollar a ticket. Mm -hmm. Center stage does. And they get a very uh, favorable rate. Okay. So we want them there. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a great service. They do yeah. a great job. And we're good partners with them. We've been with them for a long time. Uh, and they provide something that's very unique and important yeah. in the community. No, they, they, do a, they do a great job. I mean, the one thing that I think would increase their ticket sales a lot, the last I checked, they're still requiring masks. Yeah, I know. Which, it's crazy. Which is insane. I mean, that, I know a number of people who I don't go don't there. I don't know what their ticket Who do not go there because of that. And so the if... The last play had to wear a mask for the first time, but the play was really good. Yeah, the, the play was good, but I mean, sitting, I mean, <clears throat> anyway. Uh, I, what's that? I would think if it's our facility that we would be in charge of that wearing masks. I'll have to look into that. I was not... I, I don't know what they're requiring at their shows. I mean, we let them run their business in in our building. When they've rented it, it's it's theirs. So yeah, I, I know that they've said that their their actors are yeah. concerned. Only I've talked to a few other actors who yeah. are not concerned about that. But anyway, I think that their it would be benefit everybody. Okay. So all right, excellent. Go ahead. Right. Uh, no, uh, Councilmember Dovey, your light's oh. still on. Is that okay? All right. Go ahead, John. Moving on to jewel number two in our crown. So this is the Federal Way Community Center, a uh, special place in my heart, and I think everybody's heart should be. Uh, uh, I got to help design this building, build this building, open this building, and uh, worked in that building for seven years uh, before I moved over to City Hall. Um, I'm incredibly proud of that building and its staff and what we do there. So. Um, so the community center, uh, we do a lot of things uh, for the community. One of the things that's probably underrated, and Leif, I asked him to provide me these numbers, and I think he did, and I think I forgot to write them down, but uh, swim lessons for the past, we've been open 15 years. We opened in 2007. We're almost to our 16th anniversary, uh, March. 
March 7th. That's how important it is to me. I know that off the top of my head. Um, so swim lessons, tens of thousands. How many lives have been saved? It's impossible to quantify. But how many lives have been changed in a positive way? How many kids now will go on a boat or will go fishing or go around water or go to a swim party because they learned to swim with us or any other pool, but I'm taking credit for what we taught. King County Aquatic Center, everybody has a pool, does swim lessons. But that is a tremendously important service that we provide for the city. And frankly, we're over full. Our lessons fill up every single time. King County Aquatic Center fills. So there's more demand than there is space and, avail and availability to do so. Um, obviously, we do great work with all members of the community from babies. We have baby swim classes, uh, baby and parent swim classes, toddler swim classes. Come play with me, which is a, a, a children's play group with parents. Uh, and then all the way up to seniors. We have people 100 years old in there in fitness classes and fall prevention classes, dr uh, driver's education. We do uh, outreach into the Korean community and the Hispanic community for uh, nutritious lunch programs that they wouldn't often have if it weren't for those programs. We have tremendous partnerships across the area. We have a tremendous outreach into the community youth. Uh, I think sometimes people think there's some misnomer or going way back to 2007 and 2008 when we were in a global recession and you could park anywhere you want at the community center. I challenge anybody to go find a parking spot after five at the community center. You'll look a little bit. It's busy. We're incredibly busy. In fact, to tell you how busy we are, we're probably the second busiest building in Federal Way on a daily basis. We put over 1,500 people through the front door every single day, starting at 5.30 in the morning and going until 9.30 at night. Rentals, tournaments, swim meets, all kinds of different things for different people. We have a tremendous outreach, uh, and I couldn't be more proud of the work that's done over there and the tireless work that is done by those folks. So we can switch slides. So here are some of the, uh, the numbers. So back to 19, same methodology we used for Dumas Bay. Um, in, re in revenue, direct revenue, we did 2127000 in 19. Um, our expenditures were uh, 2,451. Um, that was a difference of 324,000. That's the subsidy. It's pretty amazing to be able to run a facility seven days a week, up to 18 hours a day, for $324,000 that reaches 1,500 people a day, every single day. Um, that's pretty amazing. And if you remember the history of, of this facility, Kenneth Jones Pool was a, at the high school, at Federal Way High School. That was a forward thrust pool. And when shortly before um, we broke ground on the community center, I got that you supported the community center, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we said we think we can run an entire community center for what we were subsidizing the Kenneth Jones Pool. We were, Kenneth, we were subsidizing Kenneth Jones Pool, a single standalone swimming pool, for $300,000 then. We're running an entire community center, putting those kind of numbers through, changing lives every day in a positive way, every single day, for $324,000. That's pretty amazing. Um, in fact, NRPA, the National Parks and Recreation Association, kind of the gold standard of all parks and recreation operations, named us the number one community center in the United States. There are tens of thousands of community centers in the United States. And it has very little to do with the facility. It has everything to do with the staff. The staff is the difference. We have kind of unwritten rules. One of them is everybody's the janitor. You very rarely find gum wrappers on the floor there. And if, we, if you do, we failed because every full-timer is the janitor. Every part-timer is the janitor. We even encourage the day camp kids who are in there to pick up garbage, and they get a prize for picking up the most garbage in a daytime. You'd be amazed how hard people work if you incentivize it and model it properly. So we're incredibly proud of that. Um, there's more that I'll tell you about. But going to 2022, same as we did before, kind of skipping the COVID years, because obviously the community center was horribly affected, just as the other two were. Um, you can see our revenue went down very predictably. Uh, a lot of people were very afraid to be in a big public setting or didn't want to exercise in a mask. Certainly, there was lots of fear uh, of the unknown. And frankly, it was changing every day. The guidance was changing every day. We were dealing with people dying in our own community, and, and it was a scary time. Our expenditures, as you can see, were a little bit higher than um, in, um, in, in 19. Um, there are reasons expenditures go up. There's a lot of state-mandated things, and uh, Chair Walsh can vouch $15 uh, 
uh, minimum wage is mandated. We have no choice over that. That's completely happening, and most of our people are young. They're, they're our employees, our, our, all of our part-time employees are very high percentage are very young, and so they're in that category. So we have mandated things that we have no control over. Just the cost of everything, as you know, we all shop, uh, the cost of everything has gone up. The cost of energy, it's expensive to, to warm pools, and we're still doing it at a pretty amazing clip. Obviously, the subsidy went way up during COVID. We didn't have as many customers that weren't bringing in as much money. Um, and as you can see, the two bottom, and I, I've neglected on the first column to talk about the, how many memberships we had. We had 2,306 memberships in 19. Very predictably, that dropped pretty precipitously uh, in, because of COVID. People were afraid, and, and they couldn't use it, so we suspended their membership at no charge to them and didn't charge their cards, and no, no, we treated people very well. And as you can see now in 23, the bottom column, we're, and that's an inaccurate number today because it's up. And I'll talk about that in, in a moment. But moving to 23, uh, as you can see, our projected revenue is almost 2.8 million. Uh, we are killing it over there, doing fantastic. And I'll tell you more in a minute. Our expenditures obviously uh, are at, at 2.29 million, 2,229,000. 2, the difference is projected right now for a positive of $569,000. We're just that, it's pretty incredible. Um, and yet, we, there's criticisms, and we're going, wow, it, it hurts a little because we know how hard we're working. Um, so with that, again, number of memberships, 1,964. I want to touch on that. We did a membership um, push this year in January. We do it every year. January is a natural time, so I'm not saying we invented this wheel. Everybody makes New Year's resolutions. Most people like me break them, but uh, we make New Year's resolutions, so we join a gym. And the community center really got on top of it this year and got 551 new members in January alone. You would think, that's fantastic. And last year at this time, we were uh, about 200 in January. So way up, new efforts, new outreach, just a whole lot. And then people coming back that weren't there became members that said, gosh, I've been sitting around through COVID. I need to get going. Um, so that was a pretty fantastic thing. But if you think January ended, as of yesterday, we had 146 new members in February through the 12th, or the 13th. On the 13th yesterday, we had 146 just in February, in addition to the 551 we just did in January. So pretty amazing numbers. Uh, we're, we're very happy about that. So move to the next slide, please. So just a couple of highlights and details. Uh, in 19, the building was obviously fully open prior to COVID, operational. Um, Miles from ESO, which most of you attend at the, you know, the start of it over there where we donate to the Mesothelioma Foundation. We raised uh, $12,250, that's pretty impressive. Uh, in 22, uh, we had reduced occupancy. The pool closure began, as you know, and thank you for your help on the pool um, and what we're doing, and that's gonna reopen, that's gonna change the game in a positive way for us too. We raised and donated even more money, $15,600. That was through, we let people run remotely and report. Um, that what they ran. So they didn't have to report to the, to the run to do that. And we ran um, during tw 19, or 20 and 21, we did run races remotely. So they didn't have to gather in a group, but they could go out and get their fitness in and donate to Miles for Miso. Pretty amazing. Um, and then you can see in uh, 23, that 511, that I told you 551, my number is correct. This, this was produced two days ago, and I was told it's now, it was 551 in January. That's not 511, it's 551. Um, uh, staff also received a $250,000 grant to aid in the pool slide reconstruction, which we're very grateful for. So that, just a couple of highlights for the community center. Excellent. So moving on to the performing so, arts and Matt, events center. So on the, uh, with the community center, I know that Deputy Mayor Honda had a question. Sure. And then, then perhaps, I mean, probably just in the interest of time, we concentrate more on just the financials and uh, getting that feedback. So anyway, but Deputy Mayor Honda. Oh, thank you. So um, do we still have a Silver Sneakers program? Is that what it's called? I don't think it's called Silver Sneakers anymore, but okay. it, yes, we have that type of program and maybe more than one, Leaf. We do, it's, it's a subsidized, they get insurance free if they go to a certain amount and we get a full membership if they go to a certain amount. Okay. Yes, we do. Um, and then the seniors, of course, you've heard many times that seniors are like their own building. And I have some ideas on how we could make it more like their own building. Um, 
which I'd like to sit down with some someone and sure. talk some time about that because um, I think that these ideas will make it more welcoming to the seniors until maybe one day we are able to build them their own building um, and then you know financially it looks like the um, center is doing really good so I'm I'm still hoping that we can have an open building one night a month for families in federal way to come and use the facilities it is you know a building built with their tax dollars and I'd like to to see it used by all families maybe we actually could get more memberships that way also sure thank you You're welcome. And I'd like to reiterate that as well, well I, I've always wanted to see one night a month that was open and free for anybody who wanted to come uh, to swim or to use the facility and going back to the 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 financial slide could you go back to it okay on the 2023 projections the expenditures drop by almost 200,000. How, how has that been accomplished? Okay, so the that's pool closure clear, certainly. Uh, okay, lots right. of lifeguards. Uh, yeah, yeah, that 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 makes that makes good sense, especially the pool closure. Okay, all right, and uh, Councilmember Seth My, Dawson. Thank you. My and hand is up too. Oh, oh, I'm I'm not seeing I'm not seeing. Uh, okay, uh, maybe do you mind if we first go to. Uh, uh, okay, <laughs> go ahead, Erica. You'll go first, and then, <laughs> then uh, Council Member Seth Dawson. Okay, so I have a question about the pool slide. So, where does that fall into? Is that even on this revenue and expenditure chart? No, it's not, uh, Council Member Norton. That was paid for out of ARPA, mostly ARPA, and the grant that we okay. mentioned earlier. Okay, so then it, it doesn't count toward this because it was paid for with a grant correct all right and and but how much wasn't that like two million dollars or i i haven't right. reviewed it recently 1.2 million 1.2 okay thank you you're welcome okay and council member seth dawson thank you for your uh no <laughs> i was hoping she would ask my question too um so we're talking about seniors and uh, uh, free services. I also think there's been requests, and I support that we, um, and you're looking into it. I think the um, offering reduced or free um, admission for youth who are low income. So just bringing that up also, or asking. We're, we're working on a program that you're well versed in with several groups have asked and we're prepared to get those groups into the building you set aside I believe a hundred thousand dollars and so we're working uh, on getting that availability at both the community center and at Dumas Bay thank you you're welcome all right so was... can I follow, can I follow up on my question go ahead about why wouldn't that be included in the revenues and expenditures so is it so because it was paid for with a grant I'm just I'm confused. So you you added a grant in to 2023, but you didn't put the 1.2 million into 2022. I mean, you could have just stuck it in at you know as the revenue and expenditure. And I I'm not I'm not an accountant. So how do you determine how grants are um, counted in your uh, report? What makes you what makes you decide whether or not a grant is included in uh, your totals? Councilmember Norton, this is Steve Groom, Finance Director, and it's the accountants that make the uh, Parks Department do that, and that's because ARPA is a restricted fund, and also the uh, each each facility is its own restricted fund. So that's the accounting uh, uh, people making sure that we re spend restricted money on restricted purposes. That's why we kept it in, in the ARPA fund. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, Council Member uh, Yovi. The question I have is um, the expenditures and the, the, the 
comment was just made, it's down because of staff re reduction over time. Does this number forecast this new staff you're going to need after the pool and the new lifeguards, or is that just based on what we know today? It's, it, it, it will certainly rise okay. depending on the level of importance right. after the pool, but it will also be reduced because of the disposable Sure. I mean, so this revenue, ex the expenditures and the revenue are based on what we have today. And then, you know, six months from now, you may come back and say, we do this again, and the, the expenditure will probably go up because you'll rehire the people. So this is just a snapshot of time. It's not a forecast for the 12 it, months. It shouldn't raise dramatically, but it, it, that no. is possible. You need 10 lifeguards at 16 or 20 yep. bucks an hour. Yep. It's definitely going to go yep. up. Yep. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. All right, go All right, ahead. I'll try to be conscious of time, but I do have some important points that need to be brought up about the PAC. So I'll go as quickly as I can, because, uh, but thank you. So obviously, very proud of the PAC and the work that's being done over there by Oakview Group. Um, they have done a fantastic job. Um, yeah, a couple of quick photos. Um, obviously, the State of the City is coming up Thursday night. Uh, we have a ton of community events over there and unbelievably good shows. Um, we can switch to the next one. So going to the expenditures, before we go into this, I, I want to say a couple things. Um, I've got a couple notes. So first of all, Oakview Group and their staff, led by Brian Hoffman, who's here tonight, uh, doesn't have to be here, but he's here, uh, and I appreciate that. They have done a great job uh, through the pandemic, and I don't know if you all know this, but they housed, during the pandemic, they housed three different city departments to help us with social distancing. So. Finance was over there, public works was over there, and HR was over there, in addition. So while the building was shuttered, but Brian also thought way outside the box and developed a very lucrative potential, or very lucrative partnership with Amazon that we could do by renting the parking lot for Amazon training and then socially distanced classrooms in the big rooms where you could have to have people far apart to do driver training. That turned into a pretty good chunk of money, so kudos for thinking outside the box, and there was many other things that, uh, that they did. So they created uh, revenue streams uh, that really helped, despite the building, generally speaking, being, um, being shuttered. So I've had some recent requests to say, gosh, could we get more high-profile acts? Could we get more famous acts? Is there any way we could get more famous acts? And I, I'm not in disagreement. We'd all love that. The reality is we have a 700-seat theater. So the acts that come in, um, they have a guarantee. So I was asked specifically about a couple, and I'll tell you about those in a second. But the building itself presents challenges just because it has a limited number of seats. So with the limited number of seats, if the band costs $100,000, you just divide $100,000 by 700 seats, and there's your ticket price. But that's not all. There's more. No band plays for just their appearance fee. There's also what they call in the industry plus plus. There's incidentals, there's hotels for them and their crowd. So the bigger band, I was actually asked about some very high profile bands that you've probably all heard of. I'll go into that in just a second. But there was also some really unrealistic expectations of the, bu the building being profitable overnight. Oakview Group took over, they were Spectra then, but it's the same company. They took over and they were really moving in the right direction. And then a global pandemic hits that crushes the entertainment industry, crushes it worldwide, not just in Federal Way, not just at the back, worldwide. No concerts, no plays, no theaters, no live entertainment, no comedy. It, it's very hard to, to do things, so I'm incredibly proud. But the 700-seat theater, remember larger venues in our area, such as our competition is casinos and larger facilities. Well, that same band that we just talked about, whoever that might be, is $100,000. If they have 2,000 seats, now that becomes a pretty reasonable, it's 2,000 divided by 100. Now that's becoming a reasonable, what's the reasonable ticket price? We try to price tickets between 35 and $60. We think that's the kind of the sweet spot, as uh, Council Member Dovey said, of what people are willing to pay. Now, we could book a very high-end band. I was asked to check out Harry Connick Jr. We've all heard of Harry Connick Jr., iconic performer. Harry Connick Jr. is the cheapest of the groups. He gets a minimum of $150,000 show-up fee. That's his guarantee. We pay him. We write him a check for $150,000. Thanks. You, come on in, Harry. And then we get to play him as Plus Plus. He has a band. That band all stays in a hotel for one or two nights. We get to pay him per diem meals. That's the industry. That's how it works. So 
that it's not like Brian could go get anybody you want. Another, another group that was mentioned was, how about Jimmy Buffett? We all love Jimmy Buffett. He's awesome. You know how much Jimmy Buffett gets? Two million. It's two million divided by 700, plus, plus. Jimmy Buffett travels with 18 travel trailers. We have one loading dock. We don't have enough room to unload Jimmy Buffett. So it, that becomes, we hear and we want that, but despite the fact the challenges that we have with that building, I am impressed. We have four Grammy Award winners in there. Four Grammy Award winners. Now granted, you don't catch them at the height of their Grammy. We're not gonna get Rihanna or you know, Beyonce or somebody else, Bruce Springsteen. Uh, we're not gonna get them now, but we might get them later on their way down. You have to catch them on the way up or catch them on the way down. But those are just the realities of what you can get for what, now we can pay for them, but I don't think anybody's interested in losing $2 million on Jimmy Buffett to make 700 people's lives complete because they saw Jimmy in a 700 seat theater, which would be an amazing thing. I've seen him twice. Uh, he's fantastic, but that would be difficult. So again, those are kind of some of the realities. Another reality is, remember this is a city facility. We built the building. Oakview Group runs the building for us, but there are things that get caught up in the, in the whole budget and then, you know, say, whoa, it's costing a lot of money, but really, we have to take care of the building, but it's, it's reflected on their budget. And just to give you an idea, the building is open under six years. We just lost a compressor on the HVAC. One compressor on one HVAC unit is $20,000. Well, right now, currently, that's going to come out of Brian's end. And he's going to go, oh, there's a $20,000 loss to start my month. That's a hard thing to hold Oakview Group accountable for. Um, but despite that, the, the pack is a phenomenal jewel in our crown. It's beautiful. It hosts great events. Every, the, the compliments. He just hosted Sona Bello, the big spa uh, group. They did their award ceremony there. The raving, these are the groups that you're seeing. Um, we had to redact their names because you're not allowed to put their name on unless you call them and get permission. But those are basically the Sona Bello group thanking us for the unbelievable experience, the way they're treated, the hospitality, the customer service. Brian's probably working 60, 70 hours a week you'll see Brian setting up chairs and tables. The general manager doesn't usually set up chairs and tables. They run on a thin staff because they're trying their very best to keep the cost of the city as far down as possible. So um, that's, that's where uh, my talking points end and I apologize for the length of, of uh, my presentation. I'm happy to answer any other questions and I have Brian and Autumn here, uh, my resident PAC experts. Right, uh, let's start with uh, Council Member Dovey. I just have one comment on your comment of 700 seats. I remember the fight was, should we go from 500 to 700? And everybody said 1,000 was way too big. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> your comments about 700, if you said that, what, what was that, 12 years ago or whenever we were talking about that, you would have been a, a good prophet. I would have. I'd, I'd, I'd get the lottery number. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, Deputy Mayor Honda. Thank you. I'd like to take on to what Council Member Dovey said. When we were making decisions about the PAC, we were told 700 was the perfect number. And I even asked if we could add to it to the seats after we built it if we found out it wasn't and was told, no, that's not how it's being designed. But we were told 700, 500 was too few, 1,000 was too many, 700 was perfect. And I think there are other things we were told that were very, very incorrect. Um, and it's unfortunate that as a council, we were probably, well, I know we were given information that wasn't correct, but it is what it is, so we have to live with I, it I and make it work. I think that was by the, uh, we had the, the consultant. I remember that meeting. I don't know if you were on the council when I was, when we did that, but they're the ones who wanted to go 500 and we said, no, we got to go at least 700. And then what happened after that? All right. Um, with the, uh, it looks like that the 2023 projections is taking a small dip from 2022. Uh, yes. And that is probably still a little bit of, well, Brian, you or Autumn, any, uh, uh anything I can talk about why the, uh, we go down from 22 actuals to the 22 projection being down just a touch. I mean, it's about. A little less than 100,000. But, but, but with that, the number of tickets sold is a, a significant increase. Number of events, 
for the theater number of events for this the space and so the number of tickets it looks like it should be an increase rather than a, a decrease and I'll let Steve jump in here too as well. But one of the things to keep in consideration, and this is across the board for all of the venues, um, but the PAC specifically, those revenue um, numbers that come directly out of the city's financial system also include new market tax credit donation stuff, other debt service items. So some of that fluctuates based off of where those numbers sit. Um, we're happy to pull just straight revenue projections for um, ticketing and revenue and all those. Those are in the MFRs that you guys receive each month at FedRAC, but those numbers are inclusive of everything encompassing at the pack. We so the 2.9 million picture. isn't just isn't just ticket revenue, but it's also the other the credits. And Correct. Yeah, we wanted to give a full picture of what all revenues and all expenditures for that entire fund um, calculate to for the city. And it also seems to me that we built a budget. I mean, we're a city budget. We have to have a balanced budget. And so we're putting in conservative revenues that we want to be able to, to meet, hopefully beat. And the same thing on the, on the expense side. So we'll be course correcting as we go. Okay. Councilman Rodobi. Is, isn't there a subsidy? Don't we subsidize this facility? Part of the I mean, is that factored into here? Okay, so that's really important to know. So we're really not generating 2.9 million in revenue. We're really generating 1.8 because of our subsidy. Is that correct? Uh, within the 1.8 would be new market tax credit donations as well. And yeah. so, Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, but the revenue projections for this year is going to be that they're projected around 700,000 for just ticketing revenue and just revenue. I mean, the only reason I say that, this is just kind of one of those weird places where you've got subsidy and you've got tickets and you've got good to the order of the city and lots of different things. So I get it. And now I know what the number is. And, and that's the same across um, any subsidy, even in the other funds. I mean, within the PAC, the community center, Dumas Bay, anything that's supported in there is included in an overall, overall revenue per picture. However, as we move forward in the future, if that's something the council would prefer to see. Oh. On our, so at FedRAC or what you guys receive in the MFR, those are broken down more specifically. It shows exactly what the ticket revenue is as well as any money coming in from the general fund or um, taxes, as well as any, for us, new market tax credit donation and things of that nature. But we can speak more to that so that way you guys have a monthly clearer picture okay. at our monthly updates. Yeah, I, I think on that it's important that, you know, if it's going to be showing revenue, that it indicates where it's from. What part is is revenue that's from the actual market? You know, the, the, the ticketing revenue, what's from subsidies, what's from uh, Credits, whatever else, and and so and, and that kind of leads me back into, in, in light of that, uh, with the other facilities, the the community center and the Dumas Bay Center, what part of those revenues are ticket and rental revenues, and what part are subsidies and other things? So one of the things that the PAC does um, at our monthly update, and we didn't do it this month because we were part of this larger one, but the revenues and the expenditures that you guys see when we come to you each month are our ticket and rental revenues at the PAC. And that is certainly something that can be broken down for other facilities. Um, but that's what we've been showing you guys on a monthly basis because that is what is controlled as far as how Oakview Group um, navigates bringing in different Grammy Award winners, different events, to the event space, and we'll continue to do that as we bring that to you guys at every parks meeting. Okay. Uh, oh, I, I, I was just going to make the comment. You know, when I look at numbers like this, when I run my business, I just don't look at one number. I have many others that I, so I can actually see: Are we actually selling something, or am I having to take it out of a credit line, or is, mm -hmm. you know, where's that revenue coming from? And this is all good. I mean, it's in our budget and. That's the way we put it together. But from a business standpoint, from me, this doesn't tell the whole story. Um, it says the numbers, and I get it, and that's great. But maybe next time you get Sure, and we can give you that. Out. We can provide that same level of detail that we do at every other meeting. Uh, so in January, we just gave that exact information. Yeah. The detail. I wasn't here, so I Right, I understood, yeah. Uh, Council President, Coach Thank Mike. you. Oh. 
Did, did you want to oh. say anything else on them? I was just going to say that one of the, um, in the monthly financial report, which is where we pull direct numbers from when we come to, so when FedRAC happens at the end of the month and you guys get those, what we're reporting on when we come to the next parks meeting is on that. So at our next one will be a good opportunity for us to discuss and sort of converse in regards to what those real numbers are looking like for 23 and the end of year 22. So um, thank you very much, Autumn. I, I um, understand that this is not meant to be a revenue generator. We know that. It's how much are we not able to afford is, is the problem now. So we're, how much, 1 million that we're subsidizing right now, 1 point what? It's one million eleven thousand is okay. the approved budget for this year. Correct. Um, yeah, every year. And then the other part that we're still subsidizing is the um, bonds for the um, the kitchen and the. I think it's still five million that we still owe on the capital bonds for the project. So it's one point six per year. I think that is out of our pocket every year. If I'm wrong, maybe Steve Groom could tell me. The debt on the pack I believe is currently at six million in yeah. total there's yeah. there's the, there's a geo there's a general obligation piece and then there's the piece that was financed through HUD yeah but the total balance right now is six million well th uh, that we owe and yeah. so <coughs> how much do we pay per year on the bonds uh, <coughs> it's probably about it. half I, that I have it I mean it's probably like Five hundred thousand or well, I flip pages. I can assure Councilmember Doby that all of our uh, fee-producing facilities do lose money. Uh, we don't have a profit motive. We have a we have a service motive, and if it, and if it made a profit, the private sector would do it. Yeah. I say that tongue in cheek, but sure. but for the it's a return on investment for the city's subsidy because mm -hmm. we want to serve as many people in the. We we know well. that. So we I guess my whole point is simply we need to narrow the gap. Yeah. So we're not losing as much. And, and yes, we do want to provide, but yeah. how much can we afford to provide? That, that's the real key. Yep, and our, and our payments per year are about 600000 in principal. Yeah, I figured. So it's yeah. 1.6. So we, we need to keep that in mind because at some point, you know, with the interest rates going up and inflation. Why don't we just take our reserves and pay off the pack and save 600000 a year? And, and that's And another. then we can use it for something else. But I'm sorry, I'm just floating that. I see the legal beagle saying, hey, you can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so at some point we have to discuss all this. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Deputy Mayor Honda. Thank you. I have just one question, and it's on contracts with our performing groups. Are they up for negotiation, and can we get them more along, more similar than different? Because... We do want to support our performing groups, and I know it's expensive to perform at the PAC, um, but I do know that those contracts should be very similar and not very different, if at all possible. Thank you. All of our resident artist groups' contracts are up for renewal in 2024, and they will be gone, they are currently being gone through to make them, five of them are all identical. One was negotiated back then to have a different subsidy look or a different reduced rate. Um, the objection in that or the goal with that was that they would be selling tickets and the revenue would be there because it's a 50-50 profit share. Um, so in, it was in hopes that they would have that. Obviously that has not come to fruition. Most of their tickets are given away for free. However, yes, as we move through 2023 and look into 2024, we are looking at all of those options. The resident artist group's rates are the lowest rates on the current rental rate structure, and they haven't changed since 2017 when we opened. The resident artist groups get to choose really how much their rent is. It's based off of what they want to do in the facility. We can't control labor rates. One of the reasons for that is we do have to outsource stage crew and different things. That is a pass through for us, whether it's a resident artist organization, um, a private rental group, any of that. And so when you look at the Corral versus the Symphony versus Jet Cities or any of them, their costs are based off of what they request from us, how many hours they choose to be there. Do they choose to rehearse directly before their performance or are they rehearsing two times during the week? And sometimes they go through a cycle. For instance, we had a performance last May. When they came back in December, they added more hours onto what they wanted because they wanted that structure out of their performance. Um, so there's not a one size fits all. The one size fits all is that we keep the rates low, we haven't changed them, and there isn't a plan to change the standard rental rates. Um, 
the use or the amenities provided haven't changed either. I think the goal with renegotiating the resident artist organization um, MOUs would be that they are all straight across the board, um, but their MOUs don't even dictate any financial obligation. It just gives them the access to those low rates, which are $55 mm -hmm. and 100, 114 an hour. And it's 55 during the week and 114 on the, an hour on the weekends. But again, there are over and above costs on that that are pass-throughs, and that's labor and things that, unfortunately, labor is labor. Um, and if we went to a flat rate, we would lose on that every single time and the subsidy would be increased because we need to help support those. And so I think that's a further conversation that council and us need to have as we talk through those MRUs is where do we want to find the balance in how we support them and how we provide um, the means for them to be within the facility that is a crown jewel in, in the city, um, but also keep in mind the financials that you guys are so concerned about. I agree we need to find a balance yeah. because um, there were a lot of promises made when this building was being built and a lot of expectations from the community and um, I don't think those expectations are being met so um, either for, from the community or the council's expectations so anyway I would like to um, it's not 2024 is just a few months away so. it is a few months away and i would welcome a, a deeper conversation about what those expectations might have been and how oakview group and the city we can all work together to find balance in that and find where there may be things that we can both improve on to reach a better way forward um, because we're we just hit our fifth year anniversary it can only go up from here so. okay thank you thank you may i please ask a question John? yes go ahead erica okay thank you um all right so I'm going to get back to the subsidy information. So, um, Director Groom, was the $600,000 a year uh, payment that we're making on the debt, is that included in the expenditure totals? I don't think it is. I, th I think that's in our debt fund. I would have to double check that, but I'm pretty sure it is not included in the operating expenses of the Performing Arts Center. Uh, okay. So, and the subsidy is recorded as income on this um, on this list that you gave us. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And then on the the debt payments, is that a is the interest rate fixed or is it variable? It's fixed. It may change okay. from year to year, but it's not variable. It, it it's not fluctuating okay. with with the economy. Okay, that doesn't make any sense. So if it's fixed, then that means that it stays at the same rate. Why would it change? If uh, it changes with the economy, then that means it's variable. It seems to me that some of our debt that we have issued, and I'm not sure if it's the Performing Arts Center debt, but it, it, when the debt was issued, it was negotiated. It might have been one rate for a few years, another rate for the f for a few years. But that but that type of debt that's variable. Uh, well, it. No, it's 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 fixed for it's 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 known up front. It's budgetable. It doesn't depend on the economy. Um, okay. A step rated rather than variable. Step rates, if you will, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. And then, may I? Okay. So, to me, my problem is that I feel like we're not getting the full picture, and I think that's what um, Council President Kochmar asked for this, so that we could see a full picture. And I don't feel like we're getting that. Um, and I do appreciate the, the, um, the presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Director Hutton. But once again, we, this is, I don't know how many times we've asked for information and we never seem to get everything that we asked for at one time. Um, and, and it makes it for someone like me who I know about budgets, I know how to, you know, I don't know them as intricately, intricately as you do. Um, but I just, I'd like to know the full picture and I, I just, I don't understand why it's so hard for us to receive it from you. So what is the subsidy, the yearly subsidy for Dumas Bay? What is the yearly subsidy for the community center? And then, um, what do we pay in subsidies per year for parks so that I could take this information and then, um, that way I can I can have a better understanding of how things work. Do you have that off the top? 
just do have that available. The Doom is based um, subsidy yearly, and then the community center. Can, can I can, can can I make a, a that, suggestion? That would be in the uh, budget. Yeah. Can, can I make a, a suggestion though? Uh, I would personally, and and I don't know whether the rest of the. Uh, committee and council agree with me but personally I would like to see next month uh, for our next uh, our, our next uh, uh, parks meeting committee meeting to have the same these same numbers presented to us only with the breakdown including the the debt service including the you know and, and a breakdown of the subsidies you know that there's three of us on the council that are they're in business and one of the things that we look at is ROI return on investment and obviously with the city it's a different type of return on investment than what it is for a private business I mean there are with a private business that return on investment is much more tangible with the city there's intangibles the service that we're providing for our for our citizens and and that is and in the end that is is the, the key thing. However, I think it's important that we understand exactly what our investment is for those both uh, the tangibles and the intangibles. And and at, at this point, I I don't think that we have that full idea of just what okay, that but, investment is. And my frustration is that we have asked. This is okay. This is the fifth time I've heard this in one year, where. We have asked, will you please give us a full itemized accounting of what is happening financially with these accounts? And, and we're, we keep asking and we're not receiving it. And I don't understand, you know, it, it's frustrating because we've all asked. I've asked for it. Um, Deputy Mayor Honda has asked for it. President Co Council President Coach has asked for it. Um, I, you know, now you're asking for it, um, and and I don't understand why it's so difficult for us, you know. And then we heard, oh, well, you get it every month. I want to know how much it is at the end of each year, what an itemized list of the expenditures and an itemized list of just, you know, um, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm when I'm frustrated, it's hard for me to articulate my words well. I think it's really obvious what we're asking for, and I don't understand why we're not getting that information and, and saying, oh, we want it next month. I have a feeling we're going to get a nice bar graph next month that has no, no, no information on it. It just has lines and, and it's gonna be a, a chart with, with no numerical value on it. That's what we'll get. So, so that's what I, I. That's why I'm frustrated because I feel like we're getting the runaround. And why not just let us see it? Hey, if, can I just hey. make a comment, Jack? Uh, Councilmember Doby. You know, we just went through the budget, and all those numbers are there. Um, they're maybe not printed out the way we're talking about it, but the subsidies are there, the debt ratios are there, the expenses our park department's done. They all presented it to us. I would suggest each of us reread our budget before we have these numbers so we can have really good questions. I mean, I agree with you, Erica. All that information is really important if we make business decisions. But we're here to serve our citizens. And if it costs a million dollars to have a bunch of people go to the community center and we agree to do it, that's, what, that's why it's here. And we should make those decisions. But all those numbers are in the budget. We just went through months of all that stuff. So I'll shut up and let Steve. And I, I understand that, Councilman Doby. It's just that we ask for something specific and we're not getting it. That's my point. Okay. And I'm just, I, I just, I don't understand. Um, also, the budget is, oh, I don't know what it, what was it? We, we also got the same kind of runaround with the budget where we didn't receive the information that we asked for. And yes, I will go through and I'll read it. But I just like to get nice itemized chunks of information that I don't have to read 400 pages to find it. And, and, and I know it's possible to, to have that done. I know it is. And, and I just, I just, I get it. It does cost money to run these organizations. That's not the problem. I just want to see what, what's going on. And, and I just want to know how much we're spending. That's all. And I, I don't think it's, 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 um, 
a bad thing to ask or to expect to have answers that you've that you've asked for for what it's been a year now we've been asking for this director groom i believe you had a comment thank you steve groom uh council member norton uh um it, john hutton is eager to answer your question yes we want to give you what you want and he asked me to be here so that together we might as a team be able to answer questions and if i could just elevate the conversation just a touch for council purposes there's a there's a budgeting philosophy for city facilities that charge fees uh, and you're asking about the subsidy and if the, off the top of my head i was to say that the performing arts center we subsidize a million a year the federal uh, the uh, community center 300,000 a year dumas bay i'm less sure but i think it's in the neighborhood of a hundred thousand and it could fluctuate however if we just say for a starting place for next month's conversation it's a million dollars to the performing arts center three hundred thousand to the communities uh, center and a hundred thousand ish for the for dumas bay the next conversation you want to have is well why is that and part of it is pricing as i mentioned uh, we're a city we don't have a profit motive we want to serve a hundred thousand people that live in this city as best we can uh, Director Hutton mentioned that they try to find the sweet spot of the pricing for the Performing Arts Center so that they can serve as, as many people as they can. Same thing with the community center. And so the city is making a, a policy decision on how much to subsidy, and that's exactly what the conversation you as council members want to have. So we want to bring you the information that you want, the way you have it, so that you can set the policy decisions. And it's going to come down to pricing for all of the events and the memberships and the classes and the performances and the subsidies that the city does as a general fund to serve as many people as you can to make that happen. I hope that's helpful, and we do want to come back to you next month, and I'll commit to uh, coming to another parks committee or John comes to a lot of FedRec yeah. meetings. Is that your way? It's fine. Yes, I think so. All right, uh, ca carry on. Uh, oh, oh, oh. One more thing. Okay. So mm -hmm. it is our responsibility as elected council members. Thank you very much, council mm -hmm. member Norton. It's a fiduciary responsibility that we are, we're the purse strings for the community and we need to know exactly what we're dealing with. So we know moving forward, whether we're going to have a hole at the end of the year and how to fill that gap. And, and I would prefer to have that in a regular basis as we're going on rather than a surprise at the end of the year. And it's not that one event is better than another event. That's not the question. The question is, how do we make sure that we are able to afford everything that we, we are doing? And a lot of that has to do with all of our revenue and expenditures that come into the city plus you know, we have to look at the bonds that we're paying. It, it's all money going out. And so that that's our responsibility. And so that's the reason we're asking for this. And really, I really thought we would see the amount that would be going in that the city would be subsidizing, including the bonds. And I think that that would be not such a hard thing to present in a end of the year document yeah and the bonds are generally for construction of facilities which is different than the operations but I, it's all I know part, but it's, it's still part money coming still out part of the budget yeah part of the the investment you know and and like I say the 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 ROI the return on investment and that that is part of the investment uh, you know I think it was excellent having 2019 2022 2023 uh, I think that that was I, I applaud you for for doing it that way I think that it reflects things well but both with the 2023 projections and the 2019 and 2022, if we could have all of those, see how we're progressing or not progressing or whatever it may be in those years of, of, those, of those totals, the, 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 the debt, uh, the, the subsidy, the actual revenue, and so that we can see how it's, how it's going. Because I, I think that, that all of us here recognize that, hey, we're, we're not, the city's not here to make a profit. I mean, we're going to be subsidizing, but I think it's important to know just what that subsidy is. And uh, I, I think that Council Member uh, uh, Dovey has a good point that it's all in the, all in the budget. Uh, however, uh, speaking for myself, I mean, I have my own business to run in addition to, to this, and, and if you guys can help us read that budget, uh, better rather than each of us having to spend the many hours to 
decipher it. And I also have an incentive. I want you to feel very, very comfortable, particularly with the Performing Arts Center, because in other discussions, we're talking about that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the Performing Arts Center is an iconic building and an iconic development, that, and we want to be an iconic city. So we want to be speaking well about it, and we want to feel good about it. And I want to help you feel comfortable with every number you possibly want to know. All right. Thank you. And with that, John, carry on. In the interest of time, and I apologize, I know I have been very, very long-winded tonight, and that's kind of my nature, but at any rate, uh, the last one, uh, Council Member, uh, or Council President Coachmar asked for Celebration Park Sports Complex, and I appreciate, I understand her reasons for wanting to know that, because we're trying to get, with her help and, and many other people working on it, to get uh, uh, field turf uh, in there, uh, uh, artificial turf. So, um, you know, the Front page, I don't need to read it to you. Um, we do a lot at Celebration Park. It's a busy park, um, but it's a park. And so moving to the next slide. So the revenue, again, same methodology. Uh, 2019, we made $49,600 in, in uh, direct revenue. That's rentals for tournaments, practices, games, ultimate Frisbee rentals, all kinds of different things like that. Uh, budget appropriation is 413000 on that one. Uh, actual expenses were 503. There's there's a story to tell there, and I will tell it in a moment. Uh, number of reservations, and that is a, a, an important number. 54 separate reservations were made at Celebration in 19. Uh, estimated number of games, as you see, is 1,986 games were played at Celebration Park. That includes four softball fields, four soccer fields, eight fields, 1,986 games. In 22, again, COVID had an effect even on outdoor sports. Um, some teams just kind of fell apart. They didn't get to play for two years, and they got to rebuild, and, and people moved away, and they found a new hobby or whatever. So uh, in 2022, um, our rentals actually went up. We, we did uh, uh, a little more money uh, on there, $61,000. Uh, budget appropriation was $359. Uh, actual expenditures were $339. Number of reservations went up to 91 and estimated number of games actually went down just a little bit. That could be a just different style of play, tournaments, things like that, with different, different styles of play. Um, and then in 23, as you can see, these are estimates, uh, but this is what Cody has on the books right now. $65,000, uh, budget appropriation of 350, actual expenditures to be determined, um, because we don't know yet until we pay the bills for the lights and the water and the fertilizer and all the stuff that's uh, taken out of account over there. Uh, number of reservations, you'll see that's climbed up to 95 with a uh, pretty big bump in number of games played up to 2,446. We certainly can improve these numbers with uh, Council President Coach Mars' idea hopefully coming to fruition. Obviously, we don't water artificial turf. You don't mow artificial turf. You don't fertilize it. You don't uh, sand band it. You don't aerate it. You don't have to do any of those things. Um, you do have to maintain it, but it's a much lesser maintenance and it's much lower cost. Um, the cost of watering, uh, our park manager just told me the other night, if we, we, and we've done as much as we can to uh, help continue to manage, we have uh, sensors buried in the ground that communicate with our irrigation system. So if the sensor tells the irrigation system, you don't need to water tonight, We've got a sensor in the ground. We save up $5,000 a night if we don't water. You gotta water if you want green grass, but if we just one night, $5,000, that's, it gets very expensive to water. <laughs> Obviously, if you take that, those fields offline more and more by adding artificial turf, that's great. The other multiplier is there's a certain number of games that you can really play on a grass field in the Northwest, and we far exceed that. We far double it um, because we got people wanting to play, and there's only so many fields. With field turf, you don't have those restrictions. You can play all the time. You have to have a little time for maintenance, but very, very little. You can play night and day. You can play all night. It's been one of my dreams to have all night leagues play. Uh, when Boeing was hitting it hard, and they had third sh three shifts going, there was people playing midnight games, starting at midnight and playing until 6 a.m. It's great, it would be perfect here. There's no neighbors really to bother at Celebration Park. And the more good people you have in the park doing good stuff, the less bad people you have doing bad stuff. Good people call the cops. So we know that, we don't have vandalism. So that's an exciting thing. We are extremely excited about uh, Council President Coachmar's idea, and we're working hard from every angle 
to get at least the first two fields in there. They're not cheap, but it, the payback is it's like LED lights. There's a payback on it. You start making more revenue because you can play a lot more games. And we can reach into populations that we haven't reached into before because we didn't have the capacity with the amount of games you can play on a grass field before it turns into mud. Okay. With that, I'll answer right. questions. That's the only slide on this okay. one. Council President Coach Mark. Thank you very much, John. You're so right. you know, I, I, I very much appreciate what you said, but um, so negatively, our appropriations, we're, we're subsidizing this by 285000 per year, correct? Because you take 65 from your... Sure. It's not a money maker. It's a park. It's well, open. No, I know yeah. that. So, yeah. But um, so, um, so the budget, that includes the mowing and the, and the, field, the field maintenance and so on. It includes all that. Yeah. Okay. So my... So actually, we're losing 285 per year on, on the park. So which is... I mean, I'm not looking for <coughs> what we can do to... We're not miracle workers, but how, how to close the gap. Just like you said, by coming up with ideas how to close that, relieve the budget appropriation so we can use that money for other things like sure. security for the city. Field turf is, is the best, fastest payback if you add Correct. field turf. It's not cheap. It's about a million five Correct. per field. Right. So, so. I, I want to head for that very much. So, so currently, right now, we're losing 285000 per year on the on the fields, we're losing 1.6 million. We're spending 1.6 million over and above on, on the pack, and I'm not even sure for the community center in Dumas Bay. But all of those things, we need to narrow them down so we can narrow the gap, so we don't bankrupt the city for one. Uh, but um, that, I'm being facetious. That's not going to happen. I'm just saying so that we can be a more prosperous city. Right, Deputy Mayor Honda. Um, thank you. Thank you for your presentation tonight. You're welcome. Um, so with uh, Celebration Park, do we have any agreements with any sports groups to use the, the facility? We work with lots of different groups. By well, the way, Soccer Association, for example, ASA Softball, U-Triple-SA Softball, Ultimate Frisbee Association, lots and lots of different groups come in and, and rent our fields from us. So the Soccer Association, is that the Youth Soccer Association? Mm -hmm. Is that the, I, so I've heard rumors that when the park opened, they got a really good deal. Has, is that true, where they didn't have to pay as much as other groups to use the, the facility? If they did some, some work at the park? Taking me in the way back machine, that was a long time ago, and I was the person. They helped with some of the things like the physical labor of setting light poles, if I remember right, Jason. They helped the soccer association around the leadership of George Pfeiffer, mm -hmm. the longtime parks commissioner. They did some work, and I think they were given a little bit of credit, but... Um, our Youth Soccer Association is not complaining about any costs that they pay. They're thrilled to play there as much as they can. And we would like to let them play there more, and the field turf would allow that. But there's only a certain amount of games you can play. But they have a new contract now. They just pay a straight rental fee okay. with us. It is a better, if they're local groups, Cody, help me out. If they're local, they get a little bit better. I'm going to let Cody speak. We have a local gr uh, youth rate of $5 an hour that we honor for Federal Way National Little League, uh, Federal Way Soccer Club. Uh, they all pay the $5 an hour. The Federal Way uh, Youth Soccer has partnered with PAC Northwest, uh, which is a bigger soccer organization. And when PAC Northwest is on the field, they're paying the $50 an hour rate. Uh, the only formal uh, agreement we currently have is with U-Triple-S-A Washington, and that's uh, to run adult softball at Celebration Park and then we just have our normal rental agreements on the weekends for tournaments with any group but we only have one official agreement uh, what John was talking about earlier the soccer association did have an MOU with the city for a long time at Sahali because they helped build Sahali and, and install the turf and so there was an MOU um, but now the MOU is being reworked th with just us and the school district and, and the Federal Way Soccer Club will be off of that. So $5 an hour? Yeah, which is an unbelievably cheap rate. Stay here. Uh, yeah, unbelievable. Compared to what we just told you, the other groups pay 50 an hour. They pay 5 Well, what is that? That simply can't cover anything. It doesn't. We're partnering. So We're trying to do the best we can to serve our local youth. But when it's not local then we charge them the more appropriate rate. And the adults pay as well, the higher, much higher rate. So we do partner with these groups to try and make, you know, uh, we want our local groups to succeed. Absolutely. Much like the... Right, but... Yeah. 
All right. Well, I'm glad I asked the question. All right. Hey, uh, my, qu my, my question is, what would it cost to do, it's 1.2 million per field. 1.5. 1.5. So if you did the whole complex of celebration, would you do the baseball, the, the softball fields also, or just the soccer fields? Yeah, we would, but I, ideally the soccer the, fields would come first. You what's, would the, do, what's the total number in the timeline? Uh, I mean, the total number is 13 to 14 million for all eight fields. Okay. Uh, and the timeline, you'd be offline for, they probably wouldn't do it all in the same year. They, they might do four and four, um, just because it's a big job to, to change from a, a natural sand-based field right. to, uh, to upgrade it. Although a lot of the good work is done because there's pretty good drainage there, the setup is there. We would do some other things. We would remove that big berm between the, the, um, the, the fields five and six where we do red, white, and blues. We would take that berm off make that flat, have an area for food trucks and vendors and award ceremonies and bands, all kinds of cool stuff there for tournaments. And we would put a fence up so you'd be able to separate so no vehicles could get into the field and hit a kid. But that would be part of it, uh, that we would do that as the part of the improvement. But uh, they probably do uh, four fields in one year and four fields in the next. Jason, correct me if I got that wrong. Yeah, and it's just you, you want to rotate the fields because at some point, 10 to 14 years down the road, you're going to have to replace them. And the ability to re replace eight fields at a time. And so my recommendation is you do two fields over a four-year period, and that gets you to where you need to be. And that gives you a life cycle and a replacement cycle that's feasible for the city to keep up with. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? John, anything more on this? Just want to say thank you. Th I appreciate you indulging. Uh, us for the long evening. I know that that was long, um, right. but I think it was important. A lot of questions yeah. have been asked. Yeah. Some more questions have been clarified. And my apologies if you didn't get what you wanted, right. because I really thought we gave you exactly what you wanted. I don't want to hide the ball. Um, nobody wants to hide the ball. So uh, thank you. Well, no, we, we appreciate your work and, and we appreciate the work of all of you there. And, and it's don't just because sometimes we're asking questions that may be uncomfortable or whatever does not mean that we don't greatly value the work that all of you do. We have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful parks department in, in the city and it is greatly appreciated. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and we are obviously very passionate about the work we do and uh, we appreciate your support. And it's not unnoticed. You support and support and support and have for forever. And so. Tough questions don't bother us. We just want to we want to get you the information you want. So thank right. you. Thank you. All right. All right. And my iPad is uh, blanked out, so I need to see what we have. And I think that Autumn has the next. Uh, yes. Uh, King County COVID nineteen pandemic uh, funding for PAC. We said the same thing. <gasps> so smart. We both read it. And all of a sudden, I forgot my <laughs> my <laughs> code for so. Uh, item C, right? Yes. Uh, yes. Oh, okay, go ahead. I'll try to figure out, remember my login here. So anyway, so. Do you want me to wait? Okay, uh, all right. Yeah, okay, this is the, uh, it, it disappeared here. Oh, and then it disappears. There. All right, the King County COVID-19 pandemic funding for the PAC. All right. Thank you, Chair Walsh uh, and council members, Deputy Mayor, Council President, thank you for having me here tonight. Autumn Gresset, um, I am bringing before you the policy question that we've discussed for many, many months. It is in regards to the $50,000 from the COVID-19 unmet needs grant for the PAC. The policy question before you tonight is should the city council allocate the $50,000 funding from King County for COVID-19 pandemic relief to the Arts for Youth program at the Performing Arts and Events Center? I wanted to highlight what we talked about last month in regards to the fact that the Arts for Youth program has continued to bring um, live art to and performances to the youth of Federal Way as well as South King County since 2017 when the Performing Arts and Events Center opened. We did bring this to you in October for approval in order to utilize these funds in 2022. Unfortunately, here we are in 2023 and we are still trying to close that gap. Unfortunately, there are things that have been lost for this program during that time frame because of the extended discussion. 
Um, and I just wanted to highlight that this isn't just to bring back an arts education coordinator. Obviously, that is a pivotal piece to make this program successful, but it is to continue to enrich the lives of our youth. Um, people continue to talk about that they are fearful that arts are going to die in federal way. They're scared of what is going to happen with the next generation. It is up to us to make sure that we spark and ignite that passion for performance and for art within the youth in our community. 61% of the youth that attend these performances are low to moderate income. This may be the only opportunity that they have to be exposed to live art in the sense and have it coordinated with their education in order to hopefully help them continue their education and grow through that. So with that, I don't wanna take up any more time tonight. I will go ahead and answer any questions that you guys may have. Deputy Mayor Honda. Uh, sorry for asking so many questions, but $50,000 okay. isn't going to hire a person to work. I mean, how much more money are you going to need after the $50,000? The Federal Way Performing Arts Foundation does help um, that program to the tune of about $31,000 for the year. However, the position for an arts education coordinator is um, slotted as a part-time position. That's what it's been since 2017. So it's not a full-time position due to the fact that it doesn't need to be Monday through Friday. Their outreach and their um, facilitating all of these programs is accommodated in about three days per week. And so that is a reasonable, that, what, that goes over and above what the budget was beforehand. Okay, thank you. I just wanna make sure you're not gonna be coming back and asking us for more funding for this position. Absolutely not. The goal and the projection is that with coming out of the pandemic, that revenues start to increase and we're able to add that back into the future budgets to enable this program to continue to prosper and um, serve the youth of our community. Thank you. Council Member Dovey. Is, is the funding required to go to this program? The funding is required to be utilized at the Performing Arts and Events Center. Right, but... And it, but it's not, maybe, maybe. to answer your question directly, it is not required to go to Arts for Youth. Okay. It is required that the Performing Arts and Events Center utilize it to help support arts and culture, yeah. and that was the immediate need when we brought this to you guys back in October of what would benefit the facility and the community in an instant, and we oh. felt was the best utilization of the funds for the community. Just my thought on this, um, you know, we're talking about a program that non-existent and we want to bring youth into the program, but we also have people that are already involved in arts that are mm -hmm. struggling that could go away. Could, if it, I uh, could uh, mention just, some, I, yeah. Let me just finish. Yeah. We, we may have a philosophy differential Absolutely. difference here, but. It would seem to me you'd want to fund what's already going so it stays and doesn't disappear and then start something new after you've anchored what you already have that could go away. Now, am I missing something? Why are we focused on the youth program instead of the existing people? The arts program is not new. Um, the arts program began... It began in 2017, and the only reason that the arts program was reduced was because of COVID and social distancing. The support from the Federal Way Public Schools to push as we can host about 3,000 per year currently within our programming. And that was based off of the funding and the amount of performances that we could fit within our schedule to also accommodate for resident artist organizations, private performances, that kind of thing. The reason that it halted was because we couldn't put, one, youth were at home for a whole year, almost two. And then when we started to come back into schools, the district was concerned about doing field trips of any kind. The district never wavered in their support of making sure that this program, when the guidance from the state opened up, to bring it back. And so those conversations have continued to be had throughout this time frame. It was us just similar to when do we reopen the doors? When do we allow people to come in without masks? When do we allow people to have more than, you know, six foot of distance? That was the guidance we were waiting for. And the minute that that guidance came full circle, we pushed to bring them back into the facility. And, and, that, and that's what we're trying to do now is the program is, is just like our resident artist groups is trying to survive and is trying, to, if we had the opportunity to bring those in, the district would facilitate getting those students in immediately. And does the district con contribute any money? Uh, the district utilizes their um, arts, not arts coordinator. I, I, 
Yeah, Jack, I think your microphone's off. Oh. Also. And I apologize for not um, not knowing the name or off the top of my head, I can't remember the name of their person that helps facilitate. They're the liaison essentially between the Performing Arts and Events Center and all of the teachers to make sure that nothing gets lost in translation and that bills get paid. Um, what the purpose of this program, and we've had this discussion over the years, is why doesn't the district support more? And can we ask the district for more? With a 61% low income within our district, one of the things that we continually came back to is that when we have the ability to support this program in full, to not ask them for more. And at the time, our capacity to go above and beyond 3,000 students wasn't there. Um, we have private rentals and all that. So there wasn't a need to ask the district to provide funding for this. It's certainly been discussed and will continue to be discussed, especially as the program continues to grow. Um, but currently their support is a staff member on their end that makes sure their um, logistics happen, busing and all of that. And, and I guess the other question I have, regardless of what we were to decide to do, the money still goes to the PAC, right? Correct. I mean, so if we decide to go with more not students but with existing performing arts centers groups it still goes to the pack either way and correct and and how many students did last time that this was actually going before COVID went through this program 2,904 and how many in a six month period so is they that mm -hmm. like one day each two day each or how how many days did they actually participate we had yeah, six or seven performances in that time frame. I apologize. As we've talked about this over the last few months, they kind of blur together. Yeah. During that time frame, we had six or seven performances, and we are sold out at every single one. Because all the parents, all the parents show. Parents do not come. There's one oh, chaperone per about 10 to 15 students. And a oh. lot of times chaperones will stand or um, sit outside so that way their students can get in. I see. Okay. Uh, Council President Tochmark. Well, a couple of things, Adam. I just want to say, um, I just want to, Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Steve, but I believe that um, we're the ones that decided where the money for ARPA would go, including what would go to the PAC. But so we're the ones making the decision. But I want to tell you that the school district probably got way more money from ARPA than we did. So they are not poor by any means whatsoever. Oh, so absolutely. So you feel free to ask them for whatever money you want. What I want to get around to is where are we finding the money for the arts group that Karen Brigado is representing? I know that we're talking about that. Where was that going to come from? Steve, do we know about that? There is not a specific line item on the ARPA uh, uh, worksheet. We had a pot for the community groups. Uh, is that what you were thinking of? Yeah, where was the money? We talked about the 50,000 for that Karen Brigado has been asking for Could for the arts group. Where's where were Can we I talking answer about? that? Yeah, please. We did talk about when uh, we were balancing the books in February, March, that we always have funding left over from different things during last year and that we should be able to come up with at least $50,000. Yeah. One, one thing that we had discussed also just uh, this in the last couple of weeks is the what's anticipated $100,000 savings in the cost of the demolition of the Target building and being able to use a portion of it for right. the arts and a portion for the access to other uh, parks facilities. Okay. So I just want to make sure that we do that. I mean, if we approve this, I want to make sure that we are discussing the money for the arts group. I'm sorry. No. So, I, there, yeah, so the, hopefully. Yeah, go, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, hopefully, we would be able to do both. I, I don't see why we wouldn't be able to do both. That would be the goal, is to be able to do both. Yeah, but sometimes we can't do everything. And if you have to make a decision, what's more important, the existing groups or the new program, I'm always going to go with the existing groups. I mean, we have money we're saving from Target. We've got all these different things going on. But we're still pretty limited of how much money we have. Sure. And this is not a – I don't think this is a money decision. To me, this is a philosophy decision. Do you start something that you have had – that's been there for a long time but had stopped or do you fund the groups that are already going so they don't hang themselves and go away correct and either way we will have to come back and ask for funding either for the resident artist groups which was planned to be on a discussion as um, right. uh, deputy mayor mentioned for a budget adjustment or we'll have to come back and ask for funding for arts for youth 
Right. Not, neither program can go away. You're right, right. But, um, we, but we, and the PAC will need to ask for additional funding to support the Arts for Youth program yeah. should this not go through. But, but we just had a big discussion about uh, subsidies mm -hmm. and money, and this is to me like a kind of like that same thing. I mean, we either have to make a decision we're going to do both or only do one, because we only got X, we got 50,000 that we're talking about right now. And if we're going to do one, we, well, we say we have more, and we do have more, but you can't think like I got something back in the cookie jar somewhere that I can pull out when I need it. <laughs> I mean, this is a decision either we fund this project, which is a good project. And it's required of us to do. Or we give the same 50,000 to the existing groups and then look at this as the add on. That's, that's all I'm suggesting. Council Member Seth Dotson. Yeah, actually, you just said what I was about to mm -hmm. say. I believe that and the uh, um, na Native Kitchen. The culinary the program yeah. um, that we have, as well as the Arts for Youth program, are a requirement. Our requirements, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that said, then I think it's something that we need to continue doing and not forget or um, to, to serve what um, Karen was saying because it's very important. And Karen, thank you because you've been coming here over and over and. I've practically memorized, you know, your your what you're saying in the numbers and stuff. So, um, I, you know, that I really appreciate your effort here. But that was going to be my question, and you answered it. Uh, but also, my then my other question is, if it's a question, the school year ends in May mm -hmm. or well June. Mm -hmm. So how does that account for the fifty thousand? And is it in, is it calendar year or school year then? Um, it's both. So on the PAC side, it's calendar year because that's how our budgets work, right? We, and our, our staffing doesn't go by school year. But the programming that is programmed out, we do based off of a school year. So this season will encompass the rest of, obviously, their 2023 school year. And then as we, as the person now books out for the fall, that's a 23-24 school year. So for a budget perspective on us, it's calendar. For their season programming, it is school year. Yeah, okay. And and the same thing kind of happens when the foundation provides some support. Their support kind of covers a calendar year, and then the next budget covers a, a portion of the season and a portion of the next season. Okay. Um, is there any way, again, for what was discussed here, to um, sit at the table with the school district and say, we need more help? I think that's certainly always been a part of our discussions and will continue to be a part of our discussions and I would welcome if any council member wanted to be a part of those especially as we move forward it is a community based program right it's a program that is always community facing and transparent and so I would love to have any of you at the table so deputy mayor and I are meeting with the uh, director Quentin Morris and the school board director tomorrow. president tomorrow morning at 9 30 and we will certainly bring that up I Wonderful. hope it's 10 o'clock <laughs> That's my calendar, but we'll check later. <laughs> would it uh, would it work to? I mean, that there is both the the, the local performing arts groups and the uh, arts for youth. I mean, both of them are are programs that are very good programs. Mm -hmm. uh, if we were to, you know, and hopefully we'll be able to get more funding for both of them as well. Absolutely. Would it be? Uh, practical at this time with this 50,000 to split it 50-50 between the two of them or would that be doing a disservice to both of them and, and neither one of them be able to really uh, fulfill you know the, their potential if it's if it's cut in half but each receive half I believe it would provide a disservice only in that it doesn't provide full stability either way um, none of our resident artist organizations, even in our conversations with them over the last two to four weeks, have expressed any desire to leave the facility. They are, they are already on the books and planning all of their 23-24 programming based off of current rates, current budgets. And so with their programming not starting into the fall, it gives us more time for discussion, especially around a budget adjustment, to help support them for their next season as their seasons are coming to an end. And so it, it would give us the opportunity to give Arts for Youth full legs underneath it and move it forward and then still have time to have a discussion because ultimately with their season's ending, funding would go for their next season, which starts in the fall. Okay. Now, with, with the Arts for Youth, mm -hmm. I mean, that the school year and, and, the, and the budget year for the city and the, mm -hmm. and the, the PAC are, are different. Mm -hmm. And so, and 
and so this 50,000 would be for to be used in 2023. Mm -hmm. uh, with considering that, would Arts for Youth be able to get off the ground and actually get the kids there mm -hmm. during this 22-23 school year we've been, or would it not happen until the fall anyway? No, it would still happen because we've been working behind the scenes to try and provide that as soon as we have the answer from you guys. It, we haven't been able to go full force into it because of the, the missing piece there, but yes, we would still be able to bring forth the program. Okay. Uh, one, one challenge that, that, that I see as far as moving this forward to the, uh, to, to the consent agenda is I, I suspect that it would probably likely be pulled from the consent agenda either way that we, that we move this forward. I mean, I don't if, know. if this committee moves it forward, I'm not going to pull it. Can I make uh, a motion? Yes. Erica. Go ahead. I move approval of the proposed allocation of the $50,000 funding from King County for COVID-19 pandemic relief for the Arts for Youth program at the Performing Arts and Events Center. Second. We have a motion and a second. I think we've thoroughly discussed. So any all in Mr. Chair, just a moment, please. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> the the motion actually I think uh Councilmember Norton read the motion for council. Oh not for council. For oh, okay. Sorry. It should be moved sorry. to the sorry. consent agenda. I yes. Moved, I moved to forward the authorization of allocation of the fifty thousand dollar funding from King County to the February seventh, twenty twenty three consent agenda for approval. Second. Okay, so we moved in second, and, and it sounds like there we do have some discussion. I apologize really quickly. The date is wrong because it moved from FedRAC to Parks, and the agenda just got pulled. So we we need to make one more correction. Erica, I thank you. We just need to move it to the twenty first council meeting. Okay, I move to forward the authorization of allocation of the fifty thousand dollar funding from King County to the February twentieth. 21st. 21st 2023 consent agenda for approval take three i i second <laughs> second okay and it sounds like we have some discussion uh council uh deputy mayor honda i would just like to make sure that we continue to have the discussion about finding the funding and our um, budget adjustments for the performing art groups which should be coming up really soon and so. Yes, and Autumn has explained, I think this is the third time she's explained that we need to give the money to this group and then we'll find the, the money for the next group because it's not actually needed until fall. I think this is the third time I've heard her say that. So if we could keep that in mind that we have another few months to find the funding and allocate it, um, that should, I think it should alleviate people's fear. We're going to get the money we just need to we just need to get it and and figure out how we're going to get it and how we're going to give it to um, the other group. I um, I would say it, they don't need they would need to know that they have it coming so they can make their plans because they make their plans yeah. way before the fall. Um, okay. And but I saw some Deputy Mayor your, is correct. They've already booked their dates for 23-24. So yeah, so they need to know that they have funding coming in. Uh, yeah, I think it needs to be a, a priority that we get the yeah. mother funding. I think this council is in agreement to okay. do that, so okay. um, I, I believe we can Don't worry, forward. Karen. Yes, okay. I, I really okay. believe this okay. is a strong case for, right. for and the council president member Dolby. I just have one question, because um, I've got to go here in a few minutes, I'm sorry. But um, if we were to allocate the other 50000 do we have to do it with cash, or can we do it with in-kind? with the pack and say, hey, the rent's gonna be X a special thing, so it's coming from one pocket to another, and I don't know if we can, can we be creative, or does it have to be money, or can it be in time, time? Because we're paying, we're subsidizing it anyway. So maybe yeah, So we our, subsidize, just add that to the we subsidy. We subsidize all our parks, which is great. That's what we're supposed to do. And so maybe we think differently instead of, hey, paying money to pay ourselves, we, say, hey, we're going to subsidize just a little bit more because it's the right thing to do for our citizens and our groups. I think you're correct, Jack, that if it was a 50000 or or 100000 whatever the council deems appropriate, 
it could be just allocated to the 115 with appropriation for resident artist groups. It doesn't necessarily need to be paid out in cash to them, and there would be a, a vote to move on how much for each resident artist group. I think that's appropriate. Because we're going to pay our management company anyway. I mean, that's why we have a management company, and I don't <coughs> think they care how they get the money. I mean, as long as they get it <laughs> to do what their job is. So I'm just throwing that out. It, I think I'm looking at Director Groom. He looks uh, deep in thought. I'm thinking it's a maybe. It's a maybe. <laughs> Puts to have to work to figure this out. Yes. Off the top of my head, I can't solve it on my, on my own. Okay. All right. We have a motion before us. All in favor, say aye. 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 It passes. All right. Karen, th things will work out. Okay. All right. Um, okay. On to... I think the other items should go a little faster. I, I I believe anyway. I try. I will try not to keep you very long. You're just trying to make. You're trying to be his um, record of 8:30. I'm. I, I have no desire to beat his record of 8:30. So anyway. So. I'm leaving, so you go faster. Okay. All right. Okay. So, uh, item. Let me scroll up to the top here. See. Just switch. Uh, it just disappeared here. For me. I, it, it's opening back up again. Okay. All right. So item D, Security Solutions Northwest, Inc. Retainage Release. And once again, back to Autumn. Yes. Um, thank you again. I will make this short and sweet. Uh, the policy question before you is, should the City Council accept the Steel Lake Maintenance Shop Security System Project as complete and authorize staff to release retainage? <clears throat> any any questions? Do we have a motion? I move to forward accepting this. What is it? The Steel Lake? Yeah, it is. Okay. I move to forward acceptance. I move to forward accepting the Steel Lake Maintenance Shop Security System Project as complete and release the retainage at $5,596.93, Security Solutions Northwest, Inc., to the February 21st, 2023 consent agenda for approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 That went much better. Okay. And item E, Police Gate Replacement Retainage Release. Should the City Council accept the Police Gate Replacement Project as complete and authorize staff to release the retainage? I move to forward accepting the Police Gate Replacement Project as complete and release the retainage $2,724.97 to John R. Lescajon, LLC, DBA, Tacoma Ironwork to the February 21st, 2023 consent agenda for approval. It's been moved. Second. Uh, and, uh, okay. okay, seconded, moved and seconded. Any discussion? No. All in favor say aye. 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 A, uh, item F, Commercial Fence Corporation Retainage Release. Should the City Council accept the Steel Lake Maintenance Facility Fencing Project as complete and authorize staff to release the retainage? I do have a comment here whether or not it matters. Um, Options to consider the dollar amounts are different, so that may need to be corrected in the, um, on the agenda bill. Oh, option two has a, a typo. You are yeah. correct. But that's so option one is the option to be considered, approve the Steel Lake Maintenance Facility Project as complete and release the retainage $7,602.52 to Commercial Fence Corporation, which is what the committee recommendation reads as well. Yeah, that's why yeah. I didn't know if it mattered, but... Yeah. Okay, I move to forward <coughs> accepting Steel Lake Maintenance Facility Fencing Project as complete and release the retainage of $7,602.52 to Commercial Fence Corporation to the February 21st, 2023 consent agenda for approval. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous again. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Autumn. Thank you very much. Item G, Arts Commission 2023 Work Plan. Cody, you're up. Thank you, Chair Walsh. Uh, the item before you is, should the City Council approve the Arts Commission 2023 Work Plan? Uh, it's included in the packet, and the highlight 
this year is the Arts Commission has added the uh, Arts Explosion event that'll be on June 3rd and 2nd, 3rd and 4th. And Vice Chair Karen Brigado is here, so if you have any questions, we're here to answer them. Does anyone have any questions? I do like how it was pre how it's presented in the um, in the agenda packet, the work plan. Oh, the table. Yes, thank yes, you. That's great. Thank plan. you. Uh, yeah, I, I think that it was put together very well. Some of the other commissions could take a lesson from that. So anyway, um, do we have a motion? I move to forward the proposed Art Commission 2023 work plan to the February 21. 2023 consent agenda for approval second all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. unanimous approval uh, item h arts commission 2023 contract for services all right that's me again the policy question should the city council approve the arts commission 2023 contract for services funding <laughs> recommendations as you'll see a lot of those performing arts groups that perform at the PAC are asking for funding from the Arts Commission. And it's broken out there on the background information in the staff memo, if there's any questions. Any, I uh, have to read sideways here, but anyway. Uh, any questions? All right. Do we have a motion? Yeah. I moved forward the proposal, the proposed Arts Commission 2023 contract for services funding recommendations to the February 21, 2023 consent agenda for approval. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Approved unanimously. And next, item I, King County Youth and Amateur Sports Grant. And the policy question here is, should the City Council accept 25000 from the King County Youth and Amateur Sports Grant for the Get Active, Stay Active program to provide two summer soccer camps in 2023? This funding, uh, we're working with the Federal Way Soccer Club to provide coaches um, and offset those costs to provide a free community soccer camp this summer at Celebration Park. Were you ordering them? Right. Any questions? I had seen a typo somewhere and I always forget. Okay. That's it. That's All okay. right. Um, yeah, question about this one though. Mm -hmm. It's to serve 120 students? Correct. So it's income based, correct? We do not have a, an income base to it. Um, we're we're going to put it out to the entire Federal Way School District. And just first come, first serve. First come, first serve, correct. So once you hit the 120 mark, that's It'll, it? Yes, correct. So students can't pay and join? No. The 150 or whatever, okay. All right. Okay. All right, uh, do we have a motion? I move approval of the proposed, oh, I move to forward the proposed grant agreement and acceptance of funds to the February 21, 2023 consent agenda for approval. Second been moved and seconded all in favor say aye. aye aye it is unanimous so on to um item j community fireworks display for red white and blues festival yeah the policy question is should the city council accept the bid from western display fireworks ltd for community firework display at the red white and blues festival and authorize staff to execute the contract so we went out to bid for the uh the fireworks uh, in the past, they cost just under $20,000. And this year, the bids came back at over uh, at around $25,000 for the annual display. And so we're here asking for approval. Right. Any questions or discussion? I, I, th I thought it was interesting the, uh, the way that the, 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 by the second uh, um, um, yeah, yeah, it's it's. It was the first time I've read something like that. It was interesting. So I, yeah, they detail it out. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Do we have a motion? I move to forward the bid 
Is this? I'm so sorry. Oh, yeah, it is. I moved forward the bid acceptance for the community fireworks display and authorization to execute the, the contract to the February 21, 2023 consent agenda for approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 It passes unanimously. And item K, interlocal agreement with DSHS respite and community settings. Yeah, so the policy question, should the City Council approve the re renewal of the interlocal agreement with DSHS to provide respite service in community settings? And so what this program really does is offset our inclusion programs or adults with disabilities. They can use DSHS funding for trips, for sports, for any activities, um, yeah, classes that we do at the community center. And it makes up uh, over 50% of our, our, our revenue that we earn from those programs and offsets our costs. So it, it, j just a, a question on this. So would this, uh, things like this would have been with the, the original presentation that John did, things like this would have been counted as part of the revenue in that for the community center? The uh, recreation revenue is different, and so it's general fund, and so recreation programs are separate from the community center programming. So um, Kevin Hutchinson, our, our inclusion coordinator, um, David Schmidt, uh, our senior, senior uh, programs, uh, they're not included revenue in the community center. It's a separate okay. department, separate. so okay. day camp, things like that, okay. separate. All right, okay, very well, thank you. Uh, do you I have a question. Yes. So. Do we, does each individual have to qualify to get that DSHS? Yeah. So when it's accounted for, it's on their own personal account and not necessarily the um, community center? Correct. Or? Yeah, each individual account will have a negative balance. And then Kevin Hutchinson, our inclusion coordinator, has to go in and then balance each account once he gets that DHS or DSHS check. Then he has to go into individual accounts and zero out their balance based on the check that we receive from DSHS. It's a pretty tedious process. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, do we have a motion? I move to forward the proposed interlocal agreement to the February 21, 2023 consent agenda for approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 This passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Cody. Uh, item L, potential uses of saving from target demolition for the resident art group and slash access to facilities. I think we have already, in the course of the evening, have had considerable discussion of that. Um, is there additional discussion or? Yes. Yes, okay. Go ahead. Council Member Norton. I'm trying to get to it. I don't see it um so what is the total amount on that is it a hundred thousand dollars it's anticipated approximately hundred thousand dollars savings okay for the, for the demolition. and and so has fifty thousand been determined to go to the arts group well not not of this i mean that's a different a different fifty thousand so that, that's who, a, a that's I a didn't... grant the, I wasn't a part of the discussion as to how you all decided to spend the money. What, how did you, what were you? Oh, there, there hasn't, that there hasn't been, I mean, just in our, our last uh, meeting when we learned that there was uh, a hundred thousand, that the bid for the demolition of the, of the target building oh, I, came in a hundred thousand dollars less. Yes, I understand that, but my, I thought that I'd heard earlier and I thought maybe I misinterpreted what you said is that there'd already been a discussion of how um, the funds were to be used. Well, th this evening, I think we've had a, cons cons you know, that topic has come up uh, a couple of times this evening. And I think that there's been, j just this evening, we've discussed it prior to this coming up on the agenda. Okay, the, that's what I mean is I think that maybe I, don't I think you guys are already talking about it and I haven't been a part of any of those conversations prior to today's meeting. So that's why I was asking okay. exactly what were you all discussing? What the funds going to? Can you yeah. be specific about it? 
may be listed okay. out. Okay, and, and the, well, okay, De Deputy Mayor Honda, you had your. So, <clears throat> Council Member Norton, Erica, what I was, if you're talking about what I said, uh, every March we do a budget adjustment because every March as the, as the last year's budget is closed out, we find out that there was some funding right. left over from different pots of money and we reallocate that money. And so we had discussed at one point that if this $50,000 grant went to the arts funding for the school children, that we could look at the budget adjustment in March and find money for the local performing groups there. Okay. That's, that's all that, no, okay. no decisions because we don't know. Right. We haven't seen that budget adjustment yet and uh but we do know that we should have some funding left over from some some department here in the city okay so and then the other so then oh i'm in agreement of, of you know that i think using it for the the youth art is a great idea i just wanted to know what what had been um discussed about it and then what about the other part of the funding has has anyone come up with ideas about that uh, in in our in our last meeting, I, I guess it was our was it our committee meeting the the, the, the the LUTC meeting yeah in the, I wasn't, in the L, I didn't uh, okay that. in the LUTC meeting that was when we learned that that uh, the bid for the target buildings about coming in about a hundred thousand less than what had been anticipated right and, and I already and, heard about that and I I heard about that a couple weeks yeah. ago so and and so Jack Dovey suggested that that some of that money be used to help subsidize other programs Inclu and uh, when we we just in, in we put it on the agenda tonight to to kind of discuss how that could be used and, and part of it could be used for some of the uh of the youth groups the youth you know the the thing one it's the, the stuff that you've been backing with the um with uh, you know, in, in Credible She and, and some of those different groups, okay. use some of that to help them get into the, the community center and the Dumas okay. Bay Center, and then part of it be used towards the local arts groups. Okay, and so, that's awesome. And so right. anyway, thanks so letting, that's... Yeah, thanks for letting me know. I just I was just curious as to what y'all had been yeah. discussing. Yeah, and so, awesome. so tonight this was just a, a discussion item to discuss what we just discussed. Those are great ideas. So thanks for letting me know. All right. Any further discussion of it? All right. With that, oh, did you, okay. With that, our next meeting is uh, the next Parks, Recreation, Human Service, and Public Safety meeting will be March 14, 2023, at 5 p.m. right here. And this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Have a good night. All right. Thank you, uh, bye -bye. Erica.